I wasn't feeling very good ever really when I was plant based. I was getting sick a lot. I was, like I said, my joints were pretty painful, not completely limiting, but painful. And then I'm not exactly sure. I'm trying to think back to what kind of pushed me to try it out. That carnivore January came around. People were talking about that. And I said, you know, let's give it a try and see what happens. Hello, everyone. Adam with Carnivore Today. I thank you so much for joining us. And today we have a very special guest, Bennett Richardson. So Bennett, for those that don't know you, who is Bennett Richardson? I'm a, uh, I'm a physical therapist out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm in primarily orthopedic conditions, what I see typically. A lot of uh, recently I've gotten into more kind of weight loss clients and fitness. That's always been sort of a, a passion of mine. So um, with that, I've sort of branched into a little bit more talking about, you know, diet with patients and whatnot. Um, so that's sort of been a, uh, a little bit of a transition out of the traditional physical therapy realm uh, for me in the, in the past few years here. Okay, very cool. Is it a private practice that you do? Yes. So I just have like, a, it's just a single member company for me and I, I go to people's homes. Um, I actually do, it's sort of a, it's sort of a new thing, but it's kind of getting trendy right now as cash-based physical therapy. So I'm totally out of the uh, insurance game at this point. It all is just, uh, you know, patients pay me for the, for the treatment and then I can give them the codes, what they can try to get reimbursed through their insurance company uh, after the fact. So it's a little bit different than the traditional where, you know, you kind of go through the insurance company and then the, the provider gets reimbursed. It's kind of flipped it around a little bit. Interesting. So do you find mm -hmm. that your patients find that helpful or is it more problematic for them or? I think with the, with the right niche, it kind of, um, it works well, you know, kind of finding the right patients, um, especially because I can, you know, with that sort of setup, I can spend a lot more time with them one-on-one -on -one versus, you mm -hmm. know, when you're in the clinic, um, you might have, you know, really and truly maybe 15, 20 minutes one-on-one -on -one time, and then you're kind of splitting your time as the next patient's coming in. So you gotta be really kind of efficient that way. And not that you ever sacrifice the quality of care, but, um, it definitely, you know, it does factor in your getting fatigued that way. You can't always give, you know, 100% necessarily direct attention to the, to the patient. So I think they appreciate that. Also a lot of, um, you know, a lot of co-pays have gotten so high these days. It's honestly not that much more money to pay per session than it would be just to pay for a copay to, you know, be seen in a traditional provider's office. Yeah. It's pretty insane. I think ours is like 50 bucks or $75 copay. And it's like, man, that's, <laughs> It's up there. Right. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. It's, it's becoming a huge problem for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so you had mentioned that you're incorporating a little bit of nutrition and diet into your physical therapy. So how, how does that work? Yeah. So like, I guess, um, from my own experience, kind of, uh, you know, trying out like different diet, uh, diet plans, uh, you know, originally I was kind of more plant-based for many years and then, sort of, you know, you hear a lot of those stories kind of started incorporating a little bit of meat, felt much better then kind of went all the way in the other direction, went all meat. And I noticed personally, you know, from a orthopedic perspective, all of my joint pain pretty much went away when I did that, when I had cut that out after about, you know, maybe two, three weeks of doing that exclusively. It was my old knee pain, that injury from high school was gone, shoulder pain was gone. I was feeling really, really good, you know, in terms of like my joint health and muscle health and everything like that. So that's one of the, you know, broadly speaking, one of the main things you see in orthopedic physical therapy is, is pain. Like that's their main goal. I just want this pain to stop. And then some secondary goals might be, you know, range of motion improvements, things of that nature. But pain's always the big one. So like I, you know, if I can talk about that a little bit, if we can find anything you know, maybe it doesn't work for them, but I think it's worth exploring, you know, what are you eating? Is it causing any inflammation in your joints or uh, in your tendons, muscles, anything like that, that might be contributing to your pain, if not fully causing it? That seems like it'd be very helpful to share with your clients. Are they receptive to that sort of a thing? Or is it just like a really an open thing with you? Or do you wait for an opportunity to say something about it? I kind of wait for, I kind of wait for the door to open a little bit. I, I do, you know, I mean, cause you're, when you're with someone one-on-one -on -one for an hour, you know, two or three times a week, you, you talk about a bunch of different stuff. You know, it's not always just about their treatment necessarily. So, you know, it might come up, you know, um, if they're, 
maybe inquiring about, you know, this, uh, this is maybe helping a little bit, but I'm still, maybe I'm like a four out of 10 pain. Now I was like a eight out of 10 before, like can't quite get over that hump, you know, then that might be a little bit of a, an opening, a window for me to, you know, maybe introduce and not, you know, not push it. I'm not trying to push any sort of ideology or anything, but you know, have you ever thought about, you know, maybe what you're eating? What, what is the typical day of, uh, eating look like for you? Are you having a lot of processed foods, um, you know, a lot of sugary stuff, or is it more whole foods, you know, kind of, kind of just sort of getting a foot in the door that way. And then kind of seeing where it goes from there, if they're receptive to hearing about it and even trying it, then we can go further down that road. But, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't try to really push it too much on them if they're, you know, res- resistant to it in any way. That makes sense. So are there any patients that maybe get bug eyed when they hear you talk about a carnivore diet? <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's cause that's what we've always heard, right? You know, like uh, you get worried about heart health or cholesterol or things of that nature. That's kind of the classic, classic fear when it comes to meat, especially, you know, maybe fattier meats or red meat, right? It's like, you don't want that in your body. You don't want too much of it, if any at all. So I think that is, yeah, it's, it's sort of um, really a, a big change for a lot of people, but Maybe not as much, you know, because again, it, it depends. Like if it was the first time I was talking with them, they might be, you know, a little bit more defensive about it. But once, you know, you establish a little bit of a relationship, I think sometimes you might be a little bit more open to, you know, maybe hearing some of my ideas if they've, you know, benefited from some of the other things I've shown them or told them that might be a little bit, uh, you know, they might be a little bit more open to it, to learning about something I might be talking to them about that way. Right. For sure. So how did you actually hear about the carnivore diet? That's a, that's a good question. I was trying to think the other day, whenever, whenever you uh, sent me an email about this interview, I, uh, I think it was maybe like five years ago or so. I kind of, uh, you know, maybe stumbled across it on Instagram, some sort of social media. I think I probably saw, uh, it was either it would have been Joe Rogan or uh, Sean Baker, like kind of, you know, some of the, probably mm-hmm. him interviewing, you know, Joe Rogan interviewing Sean Baker maybe was where I initially saw it. Um so yeah, I kind of heard about it and I was, you know, I think like you said, I was a little bit resistant to that too. I was a little bit bug eyed when I heard that because, you know, again, I was plant-based. I was like, everyone is saying, this is exactly what you need to do. This is the perfect diet. It's good for, good for you, good for the planet, good for everything. So I think that for me, I was, I was pretty resistant to it. And then, you know, again, I was like, I wasn't feeling very good ever really when I was plant-based. I was, you know, getting sick a lot. I was, like I said, my joints were were pretty painful, not completely limiting, but painful. And then I'm not exactly sure. I'm trying to think back to what kind of pushed me to try it out. But, you know, that carnivore January came around. People were talking about that. And I said, you know, let's give it a try and see what happens. And then, yeah, I've been doing it every every year since and sort of incorporating a lot of meat into my diet. Not, not strictly carnivore year round, but January always strict. Oh, nice. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's uh, that interview was essentially the same one for me. Um, cause I started for an autoimmune condition, vitiligo. And during that interview, Rogan told Baker about his vitiligo and how it actually started to reverse. And I'm like, what in the world is this? And he said carnivore diet and I got bug eyed. I'm like, this sounds crazy. You know, like we're, we're going to be eating like lions and tigers. What, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I had a traumatic brain injury about seven years ago now. So it was six years prior to me starting the carnivore diet. And the doctor had put me on all sorts of, uh, you know, like Adderall and things like this in order to have more cognition during the day. Uh, I had to go to speech therapy. I had to go to physical therapy. And one of my main issues was balance. And I, if I closed my eyes, I would fall straight over. So that was, that was pretty bad. Um, and then if I closed my eyes at night, like laying down in bed, if there wasn't a light on and I closed my eyes, I would get vertigo effects. So there, there was just all sorts of issues. If I locked, walked down the hallway in a shopping mall, just that it seemed like a vortex and stuff would start spinning and, and things were getting crazy. So I, I do attribute physical therapy to helping you know, a good portion of that. So they basically said I lost 10% of my brain function and that it probably would never come back, maybe a little bit. And I went to physical therapy for two years to try to learn how to do, you know, do balancing exercises with the BOSU and all, all these crazy things. 
And I, it did seem like it helped, but it never fully resolved until I went on the carnivore diet. And five months into the carnivore diet, I had no more balance issues. I had, I had motor tics also. So once my brain got overloaded, my head would jerk and I couldn't control it. So that, that fully resolved the vertigo effects, the dizziness completely resolved. Um, so the, I guess in essence, what I'm trying to say is, is I feel like if that was the foundation with my situation to start with was diet and nutrition, I think I would have been much farther ahead years and years and years ahead of time. Not, not to say that the physical therapy wasn't doing anything, but and I am thankful for that. But so, yeah, if, if I can do anything with you, uh, to come out of this conversation is to encourage you to maybe, uh, incorporate a little that more, more so. So I don't know if you've ever actually seen similar results in your practice. Yeah. You mean, uh, with, with patients, uh, them switching to, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, right. Yeah. A couple of people. So I, I wouldn't say, I'm trying to think if anyone's gone, you know, fully strict, you know, I know there's sort of like different definitions people have for it. Like, you know, just meat, salt, water. Some people say, you know, eggs and, um, other animal products too. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I don't know if I've had anyone who's really gone, you know, full tilt, just only meat, salt, water like that. But I have gotten people to, you know, go, you know, heavier on the meat end of it, you know, getting that up to a higher percentage of their cal caloric intake. And definitely, you know, like, you know, like everyone notices you get stronger kind of, you know, without even trying to, you t things tend to be easier during the workouts or during the sessions, whatever it may be. Um, you know, so I, th I think there is something to that for sure. I've definitely I've noticed a change that way, you know, not just in myself, but with, with patients as well, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can't shout this from the rooftops tops enough. Like I literally started for an autoimmune condition and I thought that I had permanent brain damage. <laughs> and here it is five months into it and it's completely gone. I, could, I couldn't even hardly believe it. Uh, awesome. And you know what is what's sad is... I actually haven't gone back to and talked to Chris, uh, my PT, to tell him, hey, man, uh, you know, this was a huge help to me. And, and matter of fact, I'll probably try to do that today. <laughs> there you go. I should, I should let him know. That Absolutely. way he has more tools in the toolbox. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know, it's, it's again, it's like you don't necessarily like because there's, you know, there's all sorts of liability issues when you're a provider talking about diet with people. You know, if you have some sort of other condition, if you have diabetes or anything like that, they always say, just don't even, you know, don't touch diet as a physical therapist. Don't talk about it, refer them to a dietitian or their PCP, what have you. But I don't know. I, th I think you can't, you can talk around it necessarily. You know, you don't necessarily need to prescribe them a diet to talk about diet. Like you can still, you know, we know what carbohydrates are. We know what proteins are. We can talk about the components of it. We can talk about, you know, things that are available for people to find online themselves, you know, and without saying this is how you should eat. This is what you need to eat at this time and getting into, you know, maybe some liability trouble that way. So, yeah, I think it's, it should be a part of all, every clinical practice. I love that. So that, that leads me into the next thing that I want to talk about. So I found you because my wife is an occupational therapist and she was doing internet search on essentially how, how can she incorporate talking about diet and suggesting that to her patients uh, without crossing the line, if you will, legally? Um, and she ran across your article uh, and your article is titled Talking to Patients About Diet. Is Carnivore Truly a Panacea? Mm -hmm. And she said, hey, Adam, uh, have you seen this guy? Have, have you uh, heard of this guy? I said, no, no, I, I need to connect with him. So. Yeah. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that article and maybe give some tips for clinicians and medical professionals that maybe are in the low, you know, they're into low carb and carnivore keto. They know how it can help, but they feel like their hands are tied in terms of how they can convey this to their patients. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, kind of like, a, you know, like I was hitting at before, um, again, as long as you're not like, laying out like this is what you need to eat uh you know for breakfast lunch and dinner every day you need to not eat these things you need to eat these things you're you know you're more than capable as a pt as an ot you have the knowledge to talk about general nutrition stuff and 
you know, again, so you can take it way back to the basics. What, what does it seem like we need in terms of a diet? Well, we need, you know, the micronutrients, the vitamins, the minerals. Um, then we have the macronutrients, you know, we have carbs, fats, and proteins. Carbs are maybe questionable, but, you know, again, you don't even necessarily need to, to go down that road. You can just kind of talk about it and say, okay, so what foods have this in them? Well, meat has everything in it. It has everything except for carbohydrates. You know, it has all the micronutrients. It has all the, you know, the fats and proteins as the macronutrients. And then, you know, that's something, you know, again, just kind of leaving that out there, not necessarily going too far and saying, so only eat meat. You know, again, that's that's the area where people might get a little scared of, you know, that they're crossing the line with liability wise. But again, you can talk about foods, what's contained within food, you know, what what these nutrients and uh, things that we need for function are, you know, calories, et cetera. Yeah, I love that. So let's walk through a hypothetical situation. A person, let's say, had rotator cuff surgery and they, they come to you and they say that the healing is going slow and things like that. Um, you know that they're essentially on the standard American diet and potentially the carnivore diet could help. Um, maybe kind of walk through that situation on what you might say to that person. Yeah. So recently, yeah, I've kind of made that part of the initial interview a little bit, you know, not even necessarily addressing it too much, but just sort of, you know, kind of as a part of it, you know, what, what do you eat in a day? You know, what does a typical day of eating look like for you? And then if it's, you know, if they say something like, Oh, it's bad, you know, I'm eating Doritos, Fritos, stuff like that. And, you know, they're already putting a value judgment on that you know, then we can kind of go a little further down that road and say, okay, well, maybe, um, you know, maybe we could do like a food journal or something too. Cause I've found, you know, just myself personally, anecdotally, you know, again, not, not trying to give you a diet to follow, not trying to push anything on you, but I've found when I cut out stuff like that and, you know, increase the whole foods in my diet, I seem to feel a lot better. Would you be interested in, uh, you know, over the course of the next couple of weeks during your rehab, just sort of, writing down what you've been eating. And then we can take a look at that together in two weeks and maybe see, is there some stuff we could get rid of? Is there some stuff we could add in to maybe get you a little bit more of a nutrient rich diet? That's sort of a, a general starting point I'll do, especially one of the big ones is like weight loss. Again, you know, that's always something that people are interested in for the most part. So if you can mm -hmm. tie it into that, you know, again, it's like, if we can look at this, just, you know, eat like you do normally for two weeks, write it all down. And then let's see, okay, every day you had two Oreos for dessert. Maybe could we cut that even back to one? Could we do one Oreo for a week? You know, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to get those out of your life, but can we take it down a little bit, cut it in half? And then, you know, in time, are you starting to feel a little bit better now that you have a little bit less of that, maybe sugar causing the inflammation in that rotator cuff area? Okay, let's see. Maybe could we try a week where we cut it out completely and just see how you feel? You can come back to it if you want after that, but let's see what happens if we cut it out. Is your shoulder starting to feel better? Is your strength getting better? Again, just little baby steps. Uh, I feel like um, that's much less intimidating to approach than saying, okay, we need to cut this all out right now. You're strictly on meat. Here we go. Good to go. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I love that. So what exactly inspired you to write that article? So I do, um, that's a big part of kind of my, uh, my work now in general. So I see patients probably about half the time and then I do writing about half the time as well. So I write for a bunch of different, um, you know, health and fitness blogs and ghost writing and things of that nature. Um, that was just kind of, kind of one in a slew of, um, of topics that was, uh, I don't know if that was one I, I, uh, presented to someone else or if someone asked me to write about it, I, sometimes it's hard to, hard to remember where they, where they all come from, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was a fun one to write. You know, obviously it's something I'm, I'm passionate about and I believe in. So that was, uh, that was a, a good one. Yeah, it definitely was a good one because it, it's it's hard to find medical professionals that actually seemingly promote a carnivore diet, which is the exact opposite of everything we're ever told. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so as soon as I seen that, I'm like, I, I have to talk to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to before you became a physical therapist. Why, why exactly did you become a physical therapist? What inspired you to do that? I would say the main thing, you know, kind of just broadly speaking, is I wanted to do something that would help people, you know, kind of have a, a clear, positive impact on helping people. Um, that's sort of where I, you know, started, even like in high school or before that. I always knew I wanted to do something that way. And I thought, you know, I thought like doctor probably. I thought, you know, maybe the med school route would be what I would want to do. But as I, 
they did encourage us, you know, in both in undergrad and even uh, later years of high school to do some shadowing of, you know, whatever you think you might want to do of some doctors, what have you. And it was, you know, even at that time, um, it was already the doctors were just overloaded with patients. You know, it was they, they had maybe five minutes with each patient. So they have to make quickly, you know, make a clinical decision. And then usually that's going to be, OK, how can I get, get you know, address this issue as quickly as possible. And usually that's going to be some sort of medication and it's, it's nothing against them. You know, I think that's, that's a fine, maybe clinical decision to make in a lot of cases. But, um, as I went forward, I saw some physical therapy. I shadowed that as well. Um, and saw how physical medicine could help people too. You know, a lot of people mm. without drugs were able to get healthier to improve their orthopedic conditions even if they would really start to get into exercise with some of these physical therapists, they would start to improve some of their cardiovascular conditions as well. Um, so that was fascinating to me. I, I th you know, kind of mind blowing as like a first experience. Like I thought it had to be drugs, you know, I thought it had to be surgery to fix these things. Like, so the physical medicine really intrigued me. So then I was, you know, kind of thinking of chiropractic, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and sort of settled on the physical therapy. I really liked the, um, the gait training aspects of it as being a big part of it. Um, kind of the uh, the evaluative and uh, collaboration with other medical professionals uh, just all kind of clicked for me. And that was, that was what kind of pushed me towards that. That's awesome. Yeah. I think that you are probably doing much more for society as a physical therapist <laughs> than if you had gone down the MD route. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, and there's, you know, it's always, uh, it's hard to paint with a broad brush, you know, cause there's are fantastic physicians as well that really, you know, maybe make, make it their own. I, I know some that are also doing cash based, so they have much more time with their patients as well. You know, not having to be kind of, um, what's the word, not enslaved, but, uh, indebted to the insurance companies, you know, having right. to do, you know, having to fill their quotas and whatnot, they kind of, you know, can pick their, um, pick their schedules and everything like that and make sure that they can treat how they want to treat. So, you know, it's uh, it's cool to see that the kind of changes. Hopefully, we're moving away from just uh, patients being a number and and really thinking about how we can help them fix their lifestyle and and get back to living the way they want to live. Yeah, definitely, I love that. Basically, my wife, she uh, she loves her job, but she works for a larger company doing occupational therapy, and she complains a lot about the pressure that they're under and not having enough time with the patient and having to meet these quotas and standards and how Medicare and uh, insurance just essentially drives absolutely everything. And uh, she can't get that one-on-one -on -one time that she wants with them. Yes. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. It's, um, and it, yeah, it's, it's such a, um, it's such a hard thing to break out of too, because it's, you know, everyone has their health insurance and you expect that your health insurance will pay for all of your health needs. Right. So it's, it's kind of hard to, sometimes to convince people that, um, you know, it might be worth it to, to pay in, in cash for this service, you know, rather than having, to, you know, going through insurance where yes, maybe you'll save a few bucks, but is the, is the care really going to help you get to where you want to get to, you know? So it is, right. it's, it's interesting. I, I don't know, um, exactly where it's going to go, but there definitely is, uh, there is a push towards that, you know, going out of, out of network and just paying for the provider that you want rather than, you know, having to go where your insurance dictates. I'm all for that. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you get a more specialized uh, care, you get more attention and you get more than, well, at least with MDs. I mean, it literally seems like they don't even care what you say when you go in there. Like it's just flying over their head and they didn't even hear what you said. And they're like, yep. Okay. <laughs> Signing something and walking out the door. It's uh, it's, it's frustrating. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, or do you feel like you're sort of alone in your profession or uh, even just in a broader sense in, in healthcare in terms of potentially offering or suggesting to a client uh, the carnivore diet or a low carb diet? Or do you, do you know of others that in this, in your circle that also do the same thing? I would say it's not uh, a big focus for a lot of people. Um, I think people have expectations when they go to physical therapy that it's going to be strictly focused on the exercise and the manual therapy and, um, you know, maybe a couple of other treatments there, you know, the TENS, the ultrasound, what have you, maybe some of those more passive modalities. But, um, 
Yes, yeah, so I would say probably there's not a ton that I know of, at least. I know that I know that they're out there. You know, you see on Facebook groups and stuff like that, people people talking about it. But um, yeah, I, th- I think more people focus on the physical rehabilitative component of it rather than the nutritional. I would say I'm fa- sort of unique in my circle around here. Yeah. Okay, so you're the you're the black sheep, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> for now, for now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Awesome. So I want to hit on something that you put in this article. In your article, you say that there's a potential for improving athletic performance by eating a carnivore diet. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So yeah, that's probably, um, it's probably going again, a little bit anecdotal on that kind of based on my own uh, experience with it. I noticed, you know, uh, again, among other kind of benefits that I had from it, you know, definitely just more kind of sharpness, more awareness of my surroundings. So whenever I was working out, which I like to do a lot of um, kind of bo- like boxing type workouts, not not getting hit in the head. I don't get in the ring, but like, uh, you know, hitting, hitting the heavy bag, hitting pads with people, stuff like that. I noticed I was much, much sharper every time I've been kind of pure carnivore that way. So it definitely improved my athletic performance. Again, that's anecdotal. So again, potential for it is... My, my potential for it, and then other people that I've heard talk about it. Um, that's what's a little bit difficult in terms of um, discussing some of these things too much is because there aren't a lot of, there's not a lot of depth of research right now on it. It's uh, mm-hmm. fairly new. Perhaps there's just not even a lot of interest in studying it too much, you know, by big institutions. Um, so yeah, there's not a lot I can pull from other than anecdotes, you know, and that sort of thing. So like, you know, if someone said, well, where did you where, you know, where's the randomized control trial that shows this improves a- athletic performance? I don't have that. I can't point you to that. But, right. But, uh, but yeah, I, can, I, I, I can't even imagine that there would be one of those. Right. Um, yeah. So it's, it, but at some point the, the anecdotal evidence adds up. Right. And then it no longer becomes anecdotal <laughs> in my opinion. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, I'm, I'm uh, pushing 50 years old. Prior to going on the carnivore diet, I felt like I was 80 years old physically. Like, this is just it. This is, I'm going downhill and it's going to get worse and worse and worse from here. Mm-hmm. I go carnivore and I'm not kidding you. I literally feel like I'm 20 and I feel like I'm way, way more athletic than, than I used to be. Like exercise to me was a four letter word. So the, I wasn't going to do it. Now I have literally so much energy. I have to exercise to burn off some of that energy. So Mm -hmm. definitely with me, anecdotally, I feel like I'm more athletic (laughs) just because I wasn't doing anything before. Now I'm actually doing something. So yeah. Can I, can I ask you what's, uh, what is your carnivore diet? Like, are you pure, just uh, like the lion diet type thing and just, just meat and water and salt or yeah. Yeah. Because the autoimmune condition that I have, vitiligo, um, I've gone strict lion diet. So just beef, and water. I, I actually about a month and a half ago, cut out salt. Okay. So I was actually having an issue with the salt and I didn't know it. So over a year on the carnivore diet, I had nausea after I would eat. And I thought, well, this might be high histamine foods or something like that, that was causing an issue. So I cut all that out and improved it just a little bit. And then I cut out the salt. Nausea was completely gone. So Apparently I'm getting enough sodium in the meat that the excess sodium is causing an issue. So, but yeah, it's just beef and water now. (laughs) Fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. Great. And before you were standard American diet, you were just whatever, um, usual stuff, burgers, sandwiches, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. Prior to that, I was vegan for two years Okay. in, in solidarity with my business partner and friend because he went on a vegan diet for cancer. So I'm like, you know, I hated raw vegetables and, and that's, that's what this diet was. It was like raw everything. And I couldn't, I can't stand vegetables. (laughs) So, um, so I went on that and my vitiligo actually got worse. I got noticed noticeably worse for me enough for me to actually research. How do I fix this? How do I keep it from spreading? And that's when I found Rogan talking about that in the carnivore diet. And I'm like, well, this is me and my health. So I'm going to try this. You know, I talked to Jay and said, Hey, I want to try this carnivore thing. I know it's kind of the exact opposite of what you're doing. Sorry. (laughs) So 
but prior to the vegan diet, it was, it was trash, you know, nutty bars, ho-hos, Twinkies, uh, donuts, what, what Doritos, all the good stuff. Right. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Where can everyone find Ben on the internet? Yes, I don't have too much of a too much of an online presence, um, you know, in terms of like a I don't have a YouTube channel or anything like that. But yeah, if anyone wanted to to shoot me a message or anything like that, they could find me on my my T PT website, which is just richardsonpt.com. So they can find me there, hit the contact form, shoot me a message. I'd be happy to talk to anybody if they had any questions or anything like that. If you're outside of the state of Pennsylvania, I can't necessarily do too much in terms of treatment, but um, be happy. You know, we can chat, we can talk about anything like that. If anyone wanted to. Just touch base that way. Okay, awesome. And then, if somebody is seeking you out as uh, you know potential therapy, uh, what, what major city are you close to? Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yep. That's somewhat close to me. I'm Dayton, Ohio. So oh, yeah. not too far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Four four hours or so. Yeah. Right. Cool. right. That sounds about right. Yeah. Well. Ben, I thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate the information that you've shared here. And I hope that clinicians and medical professionals have picked up on something here and learned a little bit about how they can actually share nutrition with their patients without crossing the line and potentially putting their, their job at risk. So I really appreciate you for joining me and sharing that with me today. Thank you for the opportunity. This was very fun. I appreciate it.